In the late 1960s, women in Britain and America began to fight for women's liberation. This political struggle resulted in the fastest and most significant transformation in women's lives there has ever been. Good. Women from very different backgrounds came together in a wave of activism, hoping to put an end to their oppression. Their sense of solidarity and shared purpose lasted a decade. You see, I am woman. Hear me roar in numbers too big to ignore, and I know too much to go back and pretend. The house one night, and uh, we were talking. He would talk, and he started laughing. He said, "Aaron, what do you think women's liberation was about?" And uh, I said, I, "I had pretty conventional thinking about it at that point." I said, "I think it's about women having the right to work, getting equal pay with men, just like they won the right to vote." You know, and he started to laugh. He said, "You're an idiot," and I said, "Why am I an idiot?" He said, "You want? Me, let me tell you what that was about. We, the Rockefellers, funded that. We funded women's lib." You know? And we're the ones who got all over the newspapers and television, the Rockefeller Foundation. He says, and you want to know why? He says, there were two primary reasons. And they were, one reason was, we couldn't tax half the population before women's lib. And the second reason was, now we get the kids in school at an early age. We can indoctrinate the kids how to think. which well, so it breaks up their family. The, the kids start looking at the state as the family, as the school, as the officials, as their family, not as the parents teaching them. And so those are the two prim the primary reasons for women's love, which, which I thought up to that point was a noble thing. You know, when I saw their intentions behind it, where they were coming from when they created it, the thought of it, I saw, I saw the evil behind what I thought was a noble adventure. Noble adventure. Noble adventure. Noble adventure. Elohim uh, made a garden. He created a garden. And then he formed man and he placed man in the garden. So let's just go back and look at the sequence of events. Elohim created the heavens and the earth. He then created a garden. That garden would serve as a job for man. So he created the garden. That means that he created a job first, then he created man to work a job, that is to work the garden. Then he created Eve. He created a woman. He fashioned her from his side, from his rib, and he brought the woman to him that he had made from his rib. And he brought the woman to him to be his helper in ruling, his helper in working, his helper in directing the affairs of this earth. That is why she was created. Elohim first, work second, family third. Women will not understand that. And after today, after last week, after week before that or from the genesis of this series 
a woman will still not understand that because that is not how she is designed. Man has to constantly remind her that Elohim is first and foremost in my life, not you. My work is second because if I do not have a job, I cannot be validated as a man. We receive our rewards, our sense of accomplishment, uh, our self-esteem, our confidence as men um, through what we have accomplished in life. And as I've stated last week and in previous weeks, in fact, in previous years, a woman who marries a man who is unaccomplished, you're going to be marrying someone with whom you're going to have to manage by way of their ego and their confidence and their self-esteem. And Yah help you if you begin to surpass that man in your affairs, whether it's your job, whether it's your projects, whatever um, appears to create the perception that you're moving forward and that person is not you're going to be involved in a very embittered relationship. Man's primary source or primary means for self gratification, primary, then there's a secondary primary means for satisfaction, self gratification, his self-esteem, his confidence is in what he accomplishes. When we get a promotion at work, we feel good. And this is applicable to females as well. But we're leading off with the males. From a young child, you get a certificate. Graduating kindergarten. A trophy. Playing peewee football. All of these things does something to that young man's ego. He goes to high school, he graduates high school, goes to college. Right? These are accomplishments and they are designed to help him with his ego. They are designed to give him a sense of accomplishment and self-satisfaction. Very, very, very important. It does not matter what a man does in life as long as he is accomplishing something. Does everybody understand that? Yeah. That is man's primary, his primary source. That is his primary resource for self-validation. What do you think the second one is? The woman. The woman. If he has a mate, if he has a partner, he feels good. And there is a process within that relationship that helps him to retain um, this sense of ego, this masculine prowess. And we're going to talk about that. The secondary source is often used for the primary source, which creates which creates a lot of problems in a relationship. So. I have to go back. It's very important to understand what a man's role and a man's responsibility is. It is to represent uh, Elohim on earth um, first as a caretaker, as a caregiver over his creation. That's number one. Number two, to serve as a prince, to have dominion over it. And number three, to serve as Elohim's priest. That is the mediator um, the mediator between your house and Elohim. These are the three roles that, that we, that, that we serve in. Here's a summation of last week's discussion. Elohim says that as a husband, you must provide for your wife's clothing, food, and intimacy. Brothers and sisters, it is a law. It is a law. When people come to me to ask me for marriage counseling and advice and so forth, you know, Aria, I want to get married. Very first question I ask, do you have a job? 
um, I'm working on that. Then you need to be working on marriage later. You, you don't you don't marry unless you have a job. Aria, why is that? You don't marry unless you have a source of income. Aria, why is that? Because that's what Elohim established. Anytime we go against what Elohim has established, you are asking for problems. We're dealing with human beings and human beings have created in the image and the likeness of Elohim, male and female made he them. So a woman represents a part of Elohim. A man represents a part of Elohim. A woman who's married to a man has certain rights. A man who is the servant of Elohim has certain responsibilities and duties. Those responsibilities and duties um, address the rights of the man's wife. So Elohim wrote in the law so there would be no, no, no debate, no conversation about it. The law says that a man who takes a wife, he must be in a position to provide for her clothing, food, and intimacy, intimacy. In the New Testament, Paul uses the term benevolence, affection, love, honor, so forth. Old Testament and the law, duty of marriage. We talked a little bit last week about sexual intercourse versus sexual intimacy. Women do not like sexual intercourse all the time. They look for sexual intimacy all the time. Men know sexual intercourse. Women translate sexual intimacy um, into love. Men translate sexual intercourse as sexual intercourse the vast majority of the time. That serves as an issue. But what Elohim is saying in the law is that a man must be intimately affectionate with his woman. He wrote it in the law. If this is something that we cannot do, a lot of times brother says, well, you know, uh, you know, man, this is like going down like a punk. No, a punk is the one who's not going to do it. Two, Paul says, always remember to express your love to your partner. Peter says, always remember that she is a weaker vessel requiring constant reassurance and validation. In other words, that's work, brothers. That's work. And as we move deeper into this class, we're going to ask ourselves, are you willing to put in this work? I have some very smart friends, you know, uh, could have gone to law school. And, you know, I asked him, why didn't you just go to law school? There's too much work. I'm not interested. Engineering, I'm not interested, you know. And it's not that they, they, they couldn't do the job. They were not willing to put in the work, to put in the work, to put in the time. When Adam meets Eve and they come together, you're going to have to put in some time. Sacrifices, emotions, commitment, convictions. You're going to have hurdles. It's almost like carowinds from time to time. You're going up and down. Paul says, never treat your wife harshly. Do not hold a grudge against them. Why? Because we are made differently. And because women are built to, 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 to seek that attention and that affection. And it has been exacerbated by Genesis or that three, three sixteen, Genesis three sixteen. Through the curse where Elohim says right now, I'm going to magnify these passions and emotions that she has where it is going to become a hardship, not just for you talking about Eve, but also for man. So now she has a, a, a just a constant longing an insatiable appetite for time. I want you with me. I need you with me. And we went over this last week. Bobby Womack says, you know, look, I, I can't be here. I'm broke. Right. You know, I got to be out working. If I'm not working right, then I can't provide you with the things that you need. And that is real, brothers and sisters. That is real. It is one of the number one complaints that women have about their men. Not enough time. It is one of the number one complaints from men. 
about my old lady always complaining about me not being around or doing this and so forth. This goes back how many years? 10, 20, 30, thousands. And so when you see a trend like that, that means that it is that it is woven in the fabric of human nature. And what you have to do is you got to go dig, dig, dig. Why is it that, how is it, I mean, it doesn't matter if I marry a Chinese woman, a Puerto Rican woman, uh, you know, a Caucasian woman, you know, African woman, Mexican woman, you know, doesn't matter, you know, an Eskimo woman, doesn't matter. They all have the very same trait. What is wrong? You have to go back to Genesis 3.16. And I don't think that there's anything wrong I think that it is it is it is uh, symptomatic of what what Elohim has established. And so we're trying to just understand why these challenges exist. And we have the answer to this. You don't need to read a book. Uh, men are from Mars. Women are from uh, 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 Venus and think like a man and act like a woman and all this other type of stuff. You, you, you don't need to watch these programs. All you need to do is to take a critical, do a critical analysis of the text and dig deep into the text to see what Elohim has created. Paul says, never treat your wife harshly. It's kind of, you know, it's easy to do because we feel encapsulated and encaged. We, we feel like, you know, see, you just not listening. You're, you're just not listening. And no, she is not listening because women listen with their emotions. They listen with their emotions. And if those emotions are not being addressed, right, then guess what? It's shut down mode. And so you have to speak to the emotions. You cannot speak to logic. You cannot speak to the um, uh, to the absolute elements within the present circumstances. You cannot speak to those. You have to speak to the emotions that 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 surround the circumstances. You have to speak to the to the emotions that are interpreting the circumstances and the situations. You have to do that. That's the reason why women and men say we have a what problem? A communication problem. A communication problem. Now, why is there a communication problem? It goes back to how Eve was created and how man was created. Then it is exacerbated times 10 with Genesis 3.16. And so, yes, men get mad. You know, we... Leave, don't want to come back. Women get mad. Leave, don't want to come back and so forth. And what's taking place is really we are because we're not seeking righteous answers and righteous resolve. What ends up taking place? We, we make a mockery of one, the constitution of marriage to the constitution of relationships. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Women's self-esteem and their confidence is largely bound in their perception of how their partner feels about them. Too fat, too skinny, too this, too that. Um, how do you feel? You know, honey, how do I look in these jeans? Well, you look uh, orca, you know. Um, <laughs> Um, th that's going to be a sister that's going to be mad for years, <laughs> years, years, even if she does look like, you know, Orca in those uh, jeans, you got to say, baby, you look good. You look good to me, honey. You know, I love that. Yeah. You all, you, to you on point. Thank you. Right. <laughs> Right. That's what she wants to hear. You know, you don't you don't say, you know, baby, you're going to have to drop 25, 30 pounds or, you know, again, you know, you like my haircut, you know, anything with the female. You always have to be positive because, again, their self-esteem and their confidence is tied to how you perceive them. And this is the reason why Paul says, man, don't be harsh with these sisters. You have to be careful with the words that you use um, that you use uh, to them or about them. 
um, 25 reads, heaviness in the heart of man makes a stoop, but a good word makes it glad. Would you have a better translation for us there, Mr. Yaziel? Worry weighs a person down. An encouraging word cheers a person up. Read again, please. Worry weighs a person down. Worry. Where you have worry, you have, uh, yeah, now just think about that. Anxiety, stress, worration. Um, go ahead. I was trying to yeah, go ahead. Pull, sure. up, pull up all of them. Yeah, well, that's great. And while you're doing that, I'm going to look at some something else. Again. How how a woman feels about herself. Now we're we're still dealing with you know Adam's duty to to the woman, his responsibility, self esteem, self esteem. Yah have mercy, self esteem is critical, very 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 critical. And see, as a child, as a teenager, really don't understand these things. Why? Because you play with these little girls. In fact, maybe. In the beginning, little girls beat up the little boys. As the boy began to grow up and gain some muscles, things change. But um, she ain't interested in a little self-esteem then. She's tomboy, trying to climb trees, doing all this other little type of stuff. But as she grows older, she becomes more feminine. And she begins to, to, to define herself based upon her environment. How she is supposed to look and act and behave. And she wants this newfound perception of herself to be validated by her partner. And if he does not validate her, then lowers self-esteem, lowers confidence, raises insecurity, raises sensitivities. Do y'all hear me? Okay. I'm going to repeat again. Very, very, no, seriously, very important. Because men, we don't, we don't, we don't think about these things. A lot of times, we're confident in a, in a lot of things. You know, women come together. You know, let's play some spades. Let's uh, you know, play bingo, whatever. They do it for what? The fellowship. Men, we're going to go out to the basketball court. It's not the fellowship. It's to what? Battle. <laughs> we're built differently. We're built differently. For us, it's about conquest. It is about dominion, dominion. Very important to understand what Elohim has instilled in us. Go ahead. Anxiety weighs down the mind, but a kind word cheers it up. Okay. A kind word cheers it up. So you always have to use kind words when you're speaking to your partner. Kind words. And sometimes maybe because you have a past where you don't mean it, you know, and, uh, you know, say, baby, you know, let me tell you something. If I said it, I mean it. You really don't mean it. You have to show it now. You have to show it. And you're going to have to do it in a continuum and perpetuity all day, every single day. Men's duty. And we're not talking about something that. He has created and assigned to himself. We're talking about something that Elohim has assigned to him. Whenever you, you say to um, a woman, um, you know, this is what Elohim requires me to do for you. And you show it right. You are safe. There are going to be a lot of expectations that women and people are going to put on you outside of the law. And it's very hard to carry those burdens, brothers and sisters. Very difficult. I will tell you, don't even try and explain to a person why you're not even going to attempt. What Elohim has given to us in terms of men and what Elohim has made um, an inalienable right to a woman and for a woman is sufficient. Don't add anything to it and don't take anything away from it. Live in harmony with the outline that he has created and you're going to find perfect peace. That is a guarantee. Ease divine duty. Wives were created to serve their husbands. I know people 
especially women have a, a challenge with the word serve, Oved, to work for, to work for, serve their husbands. And in serving their husbands, they are serving Elohim. They will always receive the protection and blessings of Elohim, providing they are doing what Elohim requires of them. Let me tell you something, and I'll bring it up. And my father comes in here to drop off some sweet potatoes in a couple of weeks. Don't don't tell him I told you this. But let me tell you, my mother's an educator. She's been an educator for 36 years. And, um, you know, I asked my mom because I saw a lot of farmers and I saw their wives uh, driving the tractors um, while the the husbands were behind the tractors behind the plow planting or doing whatever you know and I noticed that uh, thought something was kind of eerie but then um, I noticed how my father brought it up my father said you see all these farmers out here you see where their wives are and I said yeah he says they are out there working with their husbands and uh, where, where's your mama? I think she's at home watching Young and the Restless. Right. Okay. All right. So I went back and I asked her. I said, Mother, how come you're not out there helping daddy in the field? She says, look, I didn't go to school to get a master's degree in education, get dirt underneath my fingernails. See, I, I, I want you to listen to me, brothers and sisters. See, that's wrong. That's wrong. If a man is working, if this is his job, you were created to help him in whatever capacity he was created to work and serve Elohim in. You now have to serve Elohim by and through serving man, your partner, in that same capacity. No ifs, no ands, no buts about it. Education, education, education. I don't care if you have a dual PhD. In chemistry and education. You as a woman were created for one reason. And that is to serve your husband or to serve your partner. Now the feminist movement changed all that. I understand that. We're going to get to that. I'm going to kill that. <laughs> I'm going to kill that. I'm talking about why Eve was created. She was not created to sleep all day. She was not created to watch TV all day. She was not created to get the paycheck and to go shopping all day, spend up all the money. That's not why she was created. She was created to say, how can I help you meet your goals and your objectives, master? Quiet, boy, I can, I can hear a rat urinating on some cotton in here. Can look, look at Sister Nia. See, I'm trying to tell you something. Paul said, I'm, uh, I'm trying to help you. And we're going to get into all of these things. We're going to get into all these things. Yeah. Listen to me. Sisters, you want Elohim's protection? You want his blessing? You want intervention? Then you have to build a relationship with Elohim. You have to say, Elohim, I feel as though I am serving you within the capacity that you have created me to serve. This is what I am doing with and to and for my husband as you have commanded me. I now need your assistance. I am going through some tribulation in this area. Will you please assist me? Who made a petition like that? Hannah, the mother of Solomon. Elohim heard her prayer. And he intervened a number of righteous women who were doing what they were supposed to do were blessed of Elohim. I'll repeat again. Wives were created to serve the husbands and in serving the husbands, they are serving Elohim. They will always receive the protection and blessings of Elohim, providing they are doing what Elohim requires of them. They are required to be obedient to their husbands and are required to honor them and reverence them according to Elohim's commandments. Ephesians 5.22, please. Ephesians 5.22. 
We're going to pick it up Ephesians 5 and 22. Verse 22 reads, Wives, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as you would unto the master. Read what you have, uh, Mr. Uh, Yaziel. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the master. As to the master. You see, if Yah was in your presence, would you submit to him? If Yeshua was in your presence, would you submit to him? See, there's not a sister in this tabernacle would say, no, I wouldn't submit to him. Every sister would say, absolutely, absolutely. Then also submit to your husband. I, um, can we talk about that? First Corinthians 14. First Corinthians 14. First Corinthians 14. And let's pick it up at uh, 34. First Corinthians 14, 34. Verse 34 says, let your women keep silent in the assemblies, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to to be under obedience as also saith the law as also saith what see what i'm saying sisters for those of you who are married you can go to your husband ephrata which it, it never happened because you know she has a righteous husband you know but she could come and say husband um Let's see, um, you have not been providing me with food, clothing, and intimacy, okay? Do I need to take you before, you know, uh, the elders in the tabernacle for you to make good on this law? Or are you going to fix it yourself? Even when I say, oh, baby, okay, yeah, well, no problem. I'm going to take care of that. Why? Because that's what the law demands. Now, Ephraim can go to his Isha and says, uh, wife, did I not ask you to do? No, did, did I not tell you to do X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z? Yes, you did, but you should have asked me. You don't be telling me to do stuff. You ask me. <laughs> See, that's not going to work. See, there's your bosses, your masters, your lords at work. Do they ask you to do your job description? Do they tell you to do what's in your job description? What is your job description at home, sisters? It is to serve your husband. Is everybody with me? <laughs> Let your women keep silent in the assemblies, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also says the law. The law. Why will Paul bring the law out? Because the law represents Elohim's word. And for you to argue it is to argue with Elohim. It is to say, Elohim, you are incomplete. You are imperfect. You do not know what you are doing. If one wants to argue it. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for a woman to speak in the assembly. Is everybody with me? Colossians 3, Colossians 3, 18, Colossians 3, 18. Now, I'm going to make sure that we understand each other clearly. Sisters, I'm not talking about a deadbeat husband at home. Because more than likely, if you have a deadbeat husband at home, you probably have grounds for divorce, right? You, you just haven't uh, consulted the scriptures or talked to myself or or about it but you more than likely so we 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 are not talking about them we are talking about men who are operating within the uh stead or within the capacity that elohim has created them to to function does everybody understand that okay let 
Okay, let me see here. Uh, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And um, go ahead and pick it up at uh, verse 18. Yaziel. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting for those who belong to the master. Read again from another translation. NIV. Said same thing. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the master. No problem. Go to first Peter three, one through seven. First Peter three, one through seven. First Peter three, one through seven. And why don't you read that for us there, Mr. Yaziel? First Peter three, one through seven. First Peter three, one through seven. <clears throat> Let me tell you something. And so many women says, you know, I can't submit to my husband. You see, I, I can't do this. I can't. Well, why not? Well, this and that. The other. Let me tell you something. Brothers and sisters, if you submit to your bosses with whom you do not like at work. You can also submit to your husband. Yes, he may do and say some things that you do not like. But we have a commandment that 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 creates a premise. Honor thy mother or honor thy father and mother so that their days so that your days may be lengthened upon the land that you possess to honor. To respect. I don't care what my parents have done in the past. They are still my parents. And I am legislated, regulated, guided and directed by law. To honor them. So if they have a need for something. If I see them weak and feeble. They need some assistance. Because they may have. You know. Uh, slapped me from the. From the front door into the outhouse. Or because they didn't body slam me. Because they didn't call me names. And everything you can imagine. Doesn't mean that I can get to a certain age now. And retaliate. Elohim will reward you bountifully if you have gone through all of this adversity through an imperfect set of parents. But yet you uphold your spiritual integrity by not just honoring Elohim and keeping this commandment. Right. But honoring again your parents. Honoring your parents. Likewise with the husband and wife. Women will change emotional loves for their spouse over a period of time. Women will change from agape love. And we're going to read this from agape love to philos love. But at all times, respect and reverence and honor must be present. That will never dissipate according to the law. So follow along with me, please. Where are we? Go ahead and read. Are you reading the NLT? Yes. That, that Go was ahead. Wrong. Yeah. NIV. Yeah. Yeah. The NLT. In the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husband. You must accept the authority of your husbands. And, and a lot of you don't have husbands and so forth. So to speak, you got husband like husband type. It's the same rule. It's the same rule. Go ahead. Then, even if some refuse to obey the evangel, your righteous lives will speak to them without any words. They will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. Mm -hmm. Don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles. Look, I try to tell sisters all the time, why do you come in with these big eyelashes and lipstick just all over your mouth? And, you know, um, uh, you know, three pounds of makeup all over your why? Why do you why? Why? Why do you do that? Well, because see, my last boy, your last boyfriend was a punk. It, let me tell you something. If he demeaned you and made you feel like you are crap, it's because he ain't nothing but crap. That's right. My sister, you beautiful without the makeup and stuff. Well, I was just trying to look like trying to like what television, telemedia. Those people ain't real. Those people got problems. You are beautiful being you. 
being you. Don't try to demonstrate some righteous or some type of glorified appearance by just decorating yourself all up. Go ahead. What does he say? Verse three. Don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourselves instead with the beauty that comes from within. From within. From within. And the scriptures is going to tell us that it is a virtuous woman. It is a quiet woman. It is a meek woman. It is a humble. It is not a braggadocio, uh, uh, a proud, haughty, flamboyant woman. We'll read maybe in this class in Isaiah chapter three or Isaiah chapter four. Elohim cursed them. So we're trying to help each other here. Men to be men, women to be women, men to be men of Elohim, women to be daughters of virtue. Go ahead. You should clothe yourselves instead with the beauty that comes from within. Watch this now. The unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. A gentle and quiet spirit. Go ahead. Which is so precious to Elohim. Elohim says, "Woo! I got to find myself a gentle and quiet spirit. Where are they? I'd pay anything to find that. Go ahead. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They trusted Elohim and accepted the authority of their husbands. Read again, please. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. Mm, that's how they made themselves beautiful. Go ahead. They trusted Elohim mm -hmm. and accepted the authority of their husbands. Mm -hmm. For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband, Abraham, mm -hmm. and called him her master. Yes. You are her daughters when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. Whoa, read again. For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband, Abraham, and called him her master. You are her daughters when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. Okay, go ahead. In the same way, you husbands mm -hmm. must give honor to your wives. Yes. Treat your wife with understanding yes. as you live together. Yes. She may be weaker than you yes. are, but she is your equal partner in Elohim's gift of mm -hmm. new life. Mm -hmm. Treat her as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. I shouldn't have to argue with you. As the husband, you are my help me. A wise man is going to listen to the counsel, the advice of his partner but at the end of the day he has sole authority and autonomy to make the final decision and when the decision is made the decision is made let me tell you something you have a man and a woman living in a house brother comes over to the house or maybe sister come over to the house and take the take take the sister out and come in and she has no electricity. She has no water. No food. Do you know who gets blamed for that? Man gets blamed for that. Man gets blamed for that. Now the man has to say, no, 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 no. You can't blame me because I gave her the money to pay the bills. Let me go to the closet and show you where the money was spent. Look at this. Pocket books, plural. Shoes, plural. It doesn't matter. Because the man is ultimately responsible. He has to do what? Put some controlling parameters on this thing. Jude 8 and 9. Uh, I think we're out of time, right, Yael? Okay. Uh, Jude 8 and 9. We read this a couple of weeks ago. This is very important. But Jude 8 and 9, we see that uh, Mikael does not make any accusations against Hillel, against Satan. Why? Because Satan was still an angel of authority. He was still an angel operating through Elohim's anointing still being guided and directed by Elohim. So Mikael 
being lesser in terms of, here we go, his role. His role. See, when Elohim gave the signal, Mikael and Helel got into it in the book of Revelation. And Mikael and his angels warred against Helel and his angels. But until then, Mikael says, I got to show respect to you, brother. I don't agree with you. In fact, I don't even like you. But guess what? I'm not going to say anything because you are still Elohim's anointed. See, that's Jude 8 and 9. It's the very same role that woman plays. You may have issues with your husband or your partner, but he is still, he is still your head. He is still your leader. He is the one that Elohim speaks through in order to establish policy and direction in the household. And second Peter uh, two, 10 through 11, you can just write these down. Peter talks about people who are not afraid to speak of individuals who are in authority. Now, I've read Peter over and over and over and over and over and over again, and I'm reading this. This was very, very, very revealing. Peter said, you got people who are not afraid to speak against authority. And when we look at the relationship between a man and a woman, that man has authority over you. And you're not afraid to call him a punk. You're not into his face. You're not afraid to call him stupid. You're not afraid to call him dumb. And sisters, you, you make up words. Words I ain't never heard of. Disparaging, demeaning, belittling words. And let me tell you, that is blasphemy against Elohim. Is that blasphemy against Elohim? Yes. Okay, hold on a second. Because you are blaspheming his hierarchy. Why do you think Mikael pulled back? Doesn't matter how smart, how beautiful, how strong, how anointed Mikael himself is. Mikael has to acknowledge the fact that there is one that is greater than he, although he is wicked. So you say to me, Ari, I see my husband, he ain't this, he ain't that. And I said, sister, see, you got, hold on, time out, hold time. And I got to get a drink of water. Because see, you've been in it, see, this ain't church. This is a fundamentalist tabernacle. We live our life based upon the tenets of these verses, the word of Elohim. And brothers and sisters, if you take it seriously, you will see a change in your life. If you take it seriously, seriously, seriously.